Hi, everybody. Welcome to Facilitating Learning Circles. We're going to do sort of a train the train experience around uh, facilitating a learning circle. And let me navigate for. Um, thank you all for coming this afternoon. I'm going to provide the caveat that I am a little under the weather today. So if I am sniffly or I have to mute to cough, I apologize. But I will try to make that as least disruptive as possible. Uh, so who, who am I? I am Amanda Larson. I am the Open Pedagogy Fellow for the Open Education Network. And in my regular life, I am the Affordable Learning Instructional Consultant at The Ohio State University. And I developed the curriculum that I will be sharing with you today. And I facilitated the Learning Circle pilot experience that we did earlier this spring. And I'm going to hand it over to Jamie to introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Jamie Whitman. I am the Open Educational Practices Specialist at the Open Education Network. Um, and throughout this process, I was available for 30 minute consultations to uh, the folks in the learning circle and I'm con continue to be available for anybody who has questions about open pedagogy as well. So I like to start off with an agenda to give you an idea of what we're gonna do today. So we'll cover the session outcome for today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of the project, and then we'll talk about the pilot learning circle. And then I want to give you an opportunity to experience what the learning circle was like. So I have created a truncated version of our first session on what is open pedagogy. And then we'll talk about what's in the curriculum, how to facilitate the learning circle, um, our takeaways or lessons learned, and then there should be time for questions. So by the end of the session, I hope that you will be able to explain our background and motivations for creating this learning circle on open pedagogy. Um, you will gain in-depth understanding of the pilot learning circle, including our objectives, methods, and outcomes. Um, and we will be talking about everyone's favorite topic, assessment today. Uh, participants, I hope, will be able to articulate the main principles of open pedagogy through that truncated uh, activity that we're going to do together around open pedagogy definitions. And then you're going to acquire practical tools and strategies to design, facilitate, and evaluate your own learning circle on open pedagogy tailored to the specific needs and context of your own institution. <clears throat> so the background, uh, why open pedagogy? Um, so this is part of the OEM strategic plan. That link there would take you to Dave's kick off from the OEM Summit 22, where he discussed the new strategic plan for the Open Education Network. And there is an action pathway that's dedicated to open pedagogy. And uh, having an open pedagogy fellow to figure out the learning circle was part of the faculty engagement strategies and also part of the shared abundance strategy for that particular pathway. The deliverables I was asked to come up with were to develop the learning circle curriculum and structure for instructors specifically, develop trainer training to help member institutions run learning circle programs for librarians and other partners, offer trainings to member institutions for librarians and other partners, and then offer an OEN wide learning circle program based on the model for, again, instructors. But that's not what happened. What happened instead is that uh, we developed the learning circle and structure for instructors and for instructor part support staff. So folks who are in the roles like us who do this kind of work, based on the success of the certificate for open educational practices that also had a combined audience that had a team of people. So there would be an instructor and then there would be instructor support partner. And they went through that experience as a team. And one of the insights from that was that there was a lot of um, really great reciprocal knowledge that could be shared. And I didn't want to lose out on that option. I also personally wanted folks in similar roles to mine who did professional development to give me initial feedback on the uh, learning circle. So that was the other argument I had for including instructor support folks. Um, so we offered an OEN-wide learning circle program based on the model for both of those participant groups. And um, I really also wanted them to participate in an open pedagogy project throughout the circle so that they could get hands-on experience doing that work. And then we developed the training to help member institutions run a learning circle program, which is what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to hand off if you like, here, please take our shiny thing and go use it. And then today's session is offering the first initial training to member institutions on these learning circles. 
So the goals I had for the Learning Circle experience was that I would create a curriculum for the Learning Circle featuring open pedagogy topics. I wanted to create a scaffolded assignment that allows folks to do open pedagogy. So you're getting that hands-on experience and you can sort of starting that off in a really safe environment with other peers who are doing the same thing. Um, build a community, uh, learning about open pedagogy comprised of both instructors and instruct instructor support roles, and then create training that would help others facilitate a learning circle at their own institution. So we started by hitting the books. Uh, we, Tanya and I, uh, dove into the literature to see how others have created and facilitating learning circles in the past. Uh, we ended up looking through about 17 different resources on building out learning circles, and that included books, web pages, program write-up slides, presentations that investigated and discussed. We investigated those and discussed those through shared notes. And then from there, we comprised a set of best practices from their lessons learned and takeaways that we would use to create our learning circle experience. So the literature uh, really pointed out that there is sort of like lightning in a bottle to say in the amount of people that you have involved in the learning circle. So ideally not more than 12 to 15 people. Um, it makes it large enough that there's lots of people to participate and also um, helps with attrition of people who sort of like drift off after a couple of sessions, but still enough people to have a consistent core of folks who are going through the experience together. Um, there was emphasis on creating consistent opening and closing activities so that you were easing participants into the learning circle and out of the learning circle in a really gentle and kind way, um, helping them to shift and transition focus. Um, that there's a focus on community building. Um, we found lots of literature that said that a flip model with pre-work before the, the, se the sessions was great to help boost discussion during it. Um, we decided to integrate tools for open pedagogy throughout so that folks could get hands-on experience and exposure to them. So for example, we did a shared annotation activity in Hypothesis so folks could try Hypothesis out. And then we also used Jamboard for a live discussion activity in one of the sessions. We also provided opportunities for reflection in each session, even if it was just briefly at the end. Um, and the importance of allowing folks to experience open pedagogy through the learning circle. So getting that opportunity to try this out in a safe space, a uh, brave space even, where they are getting the chance to start really small and just redesign one assignment or create one learning, one learning object. Um, and then an emphasis on creating something practical for future use. So either that learning object could be used in professional development opportunities at their institution, or they have redesigned a disposable assignment into a renewable assignment that they could implement in the future. Okay, so now we're going to transition into piloting the learning circle. Uh, so what did we offer participants? They got a free virtual seven-week facilitating learning circle where they would share, learn, discuss, and create open, open pedagogy where they could build foundational understandings of what open pedagogy is that we expanded on through activities that allowed for collaborative definitions of open pedagogy. You'll get to do a little bit of that today. Um, they get to discover what open pedagogy does as well as how it can be incorporated in the classroom through exposure to a variety of engaging open pedagogy assignments. Uh, gains hand-on experience with, with open pedagogy through the creation of a renewable assignment or that digital learning object. And then they also received a 30-minute consultation with Jamie outside of those synchronous sessions to assist them with their questions related to open pedagogy. So we put out a call for participants and we had 38 folks apply to participate. We started by eliminating anyone who didn't complete the form accurately. And typically that meant they didn't provide us an email address so that we could get in contact with them. That brought our total down to 33 applicants. And we ended up accepting 12 instructors and six instructor support roles. Um, and then the remaining folks who weren't invited to this first offering will be invited to the second offering that will hopefully be this fall and will be facilitated by Jeannie. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the sessions. So there are seven sessions across the learning circle. And the very first one is on what is open pedagogy. And so the session goal was to provide foundational understanding of open pedagogy to be expanded upon through activities that allowed for us to collaboratively define what open pedagogy was together. 
And then the session, other session goal was to showcase what open pedagogy does, as well as how it can be incorporated into the classroom through exposure to a variety of open pedagogy assignments. And then our curricular outcome for that session was to establish those foundational definitions of open pedagogy and start building community. It was also our kickoff session. Um, the tool for that session was Mentimeter, which we'll be using today. We used Mentimeter throughout the Learning Circle experience as our polling software of choice. Um, and then each of these sessions, I'm going to talk a little bit about the highlights and then a Learning Circle takeaway. So the highlight that we had for that first session was that there was a nice spread of familiarity with open pedagogy from beginners to more advanced practitioners, um, which may, ended up making discussions very robust throughout the Learning Circle. And then um, as part of the activities we did, uh, there's a question about what relevant themes that they saw. And some of the topics that came up in that was that it was learner-centered, collaboration focused, renewable, that it's not just about low cost, cost and that there was ownership of learning for students. And you're gonna get to do that activity a little bit later. In session two, we talked about disposable versus renewable assignments. So building from, uh, in a really nicely scaffolded way, building from what is this thing to, okay, let's jump in a little bit closer into what actually disposable and renewable assignments are. And uh, the goals of that session were to provide an overview of what they are and how to transform them for disposable assignments. And then um, to talk really explicitly about what renewable assignments do to center student agency and potentially scaffold into larger process, projects possibly. And then our other session goal was to orient participants to develop a renewable assignment or learning object that they can use in the future. So this is when they had their learning circle project assigned to them. And our curricular outcome was to prepare participants to create that renewable assignment or digital learning object. And um, the broad idea is that it, would, it might explain what a renewable assignment is for the learning objects. The tool of that week was Flip, formerly Flipgrid, and they got to explore that asynchronously. Um, and then our highlights from that session were to start small, create active, authentic assessments that provide students with the option to do, and that also offers students choice. And then our learning circle takeaway was sort of this lightning in a bottle realization that renewable and disposable assignments are on a spectrum versus being discrete objects that are not interrelated. And this takeaway is something that I'm gonna take forward into all of the work that I do from here on out, because I think it's just such a great way of localizing that concept in a way that is less, it has to be either or. Um, they can be just at separate ends of the spectrum and we can move them a little bit closer or a little bit further away depending on what we're doing. In session three, we talked about consent in the classroom, building brave spaces, and engaging in care in the open. So the session goal, the first one, was to provide an overview of how consent function in a classroom using open pedagogy. So not only thinking about the fact that we're asking students to work in the open, um, which is new, brand new to them. They have they have discovered that they have intellectual property, um, but also that that might also require their consent to openly license that at the end of the semester when they're done with their project. The other session goal was to provide an exploration of how to build a brave space for students to participate in the open. So thinking about um, it's new for them, it might be scary, and so we want to define that as a brave space for them rather than a safe space. And the difference is that sometimes students will be like, oh, I'm uncomfortable. This is no longer a safe space. So we want to encourage them to step into that uncomfortability by reframing it as a brave space where we're all gonna be sort of open and vulnerable and learning together in this space. And then we also wanted a session goal to demonstrate about how they could engage in care in the classroom using open pedagogy. So thinking a lot about the care framework for open pedagogy and how that applies to building out open pedagogy assignments. Uh, the curricular outcome was to center student consent in the classroom and intentionally develop a brave community through empathy, compassion, and care in the classroom. This week, our tool was hypothesis and participates um, had the opportunity to dive in and annotate a shared reading. 
And our highlights were that the outcome isn't always an openly licensed resource. Because of that consent mechanism, the outcome can't be, I'm forcing you to openly license your work. Students need to consent as to how their work is being used. And then another, then the else learning circle takeaway was centering consent and building a brave space in the classroom and how those topics are intertwined and necessary when we're asking students to work in the open. In session four, we talked about very important topic of accessibility, scaffolding, and universal design for learning. And the session goal was to develop an understanding of how important it is to start building open pedagogy experiences that are accessible, are scaffolded, and that use universal design for learning in order to ensure student success and engagement in the classroom. The curricular outcome was to underpin the importance of ensuring open pedagogy experiences that are appropriately scaffolded, accessible, and built with universal design principles in mind. And this week, uh, participants explored the tool of H5P, which is an HTML5 formative assessment tool. Uh, it allows you to create interactive um, formative assessments that students can use prior to coming to class. And so participants completed an H5P activity in our Canvas curriculum about universal design for learning. So some highlights from this week was the scaffolding roadmap for open pedagogy practice, which I will show you later uh, as part of our truncated open pedagogy definition uh, assignment that we're going to do together. And then build out discussion activity about hypothesis assignment could have been scaffolded better. So we built based on the previous week and all, actually based on a little bit of like the lack of participation, I was like, what did we do wrong? How could we have scaffolded this better? Let's have a conversation about it. And what really resonated with me was how participants in the learning circle expressed empathy for students who were trying new tools by having this experience of also understanding that it was difficult to try and figure out where they needed to be in the tool to do the work. The learning circle takeaway for that week was that uh, universal design for learning and open pedagogy are complementary practices and that there is importance of modeling when scaffolding concepts to students and instructors. In session five, we talked about another really important topic, open pedagogy, social justice, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the goal of this session was to explore the synergy between open pedagogy, social justice, as well to show how open pedagogy can increase the amount of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the classroom. Our curricular outcome was to provide a brave space where people can discuss using open pedagogy and diversity, equity, inclusion in the classroom through concrete examples. And for this week, um, we use Jamboard, which is also our tool, to facilitate an anonymous discussion activity about the connections and considerations around that intersection of open pedagogy, social justice, and DEI. And then our a learning circle takeaway that week was that it's really important to start small and build with intentionality when we're incorporating these social justice and DEI concepts into open pedagogy projects, and that's okay. Session six is the tool showcase. So we wanted to provide a showcase of tools commonly used in open pedagogy assignments in order to enable participate practitioners to build their own sort of like open pedagogy toolkit. Um, and the curricular outcomes for that was to equip participants with the tools that they'll be able to use to build out those assignments and experiences for their students. And this session was co-facilitated co by me and Jamie. I talked sort of about the, the why and the how and the importance of centering student learning previous to picking the new shiny tool. And then Jamie walked them through a selection of different tools that they might consider using. And then the takeaway from this learning circle was to expect robust discussion when covering tools in the session. Participants love sharing their favorite tools and what they use them for in their classrooms. And then session seven wrapped us up with show and tell. And the session goal for this was to provide space for participants to showcase the renewable assignment, redesign, or their learning object. And then also on sort of like a more administravia sort of side to distribute our learning circle assessment survey. And then the curricular outcomes was sharing abundance by providing space for everyone to share what they've created in their renewable assignment redesign or digital learning object, and then to facilitate that learning circle assessment. And so how that worked was participants took three to five minutes to share out about their learning circle project. And I am gonna stop sharing my screen for just a second so that I can 
pull up some examples for you. So the first one, and I will put this link in the chat. This is by Amanda Gray, who is here today uh, with us. And um, I'm gonna scroll past the lovely blog post that Amanda wrote and take you down to the infographic that she created as part of the learning circle. So as you can see, uh, Amanda created the renewable assignment spectrum and you can download it here. Um, it's openly licensed, and this is a really great example of how already it has been used in something that is going to live on past the learning circle. There's this lovely blog post that Amanda can point to whenever she is talking about this particular topic on renewable assignments. The next is a little bit of a teaser. So you're getting to see the Open Pedagogy Portal, which Jamie is going to talk about in a minute. Um, but there are some examples here of other projects that came in through the learning circle. So Philip Smith submitted, um, he ended up making a Google Suites um, site. And we'll let that load. And so he created a page that he can use with instructors around open pedagogy. It provides definitions. It offers them some videos. It talks about innovation in the classroom, some more definition work. Um, and he also included um, inclusive teaching with open section. And this talks a little bit about that social justice and DEI aspect. And he also has a great section on accessibility and the OER Accessibility Toolkit, again, with some great video resources for his folks, and then also some open pedagogy resources. And this was what he turned in for his assignment. And then if we go back to the Open Pedagogy Portal, um, Andrew Taylor also created some lovely multimedia training for students. And these are Canvas Commons links. So if you use Canvas as your learning management system, you can actually download these and upload them into Canvas. Um, but he has lovely training materials here. Um, and because he thought about it in the, that his instructors were going to need support to use the tools in their classroom if they were considering open pedagogy. And those are also all openly licensed. And then Lauren Wilsey created the history of science. And students are going to complete a project on either an astronomer or ancient culture that isn't typically covered in major textbooks. And they are going to have a choice over how they license that and what they submit for that assignment. Let's go ahead and click into that document. And so she has done a really great job of creating a renewable assignment here. Um, again, it is openly licensed, so folks can take this and build on it as long as they share it out again. And so there's a, they have format options, and they have key science questions that they need to ask. She does a really good job of scaffolding this, and she provides them a really robust rubric for the work that they're going to do, and she'll be implementing this renewable assignment into her class. That's just a few of the assignments that got turned in. We ended up having, I believe, 11 folks turn in projects. Um, it was super exciting. I'm so proud of all of them. Like they're my little ducklings. Um, I was so pleased. It was such a great, great, great show and tell session. Um, and it gives you all of the joy that you ant would anticipate from that kind of uh, enthusiastic sharing of resources. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Learning Circle projects. Um, so what was the goal? The goal was that they would get this opportunity to practice open pedagogy by creating either a renewable resource um, that was an assignment or a learning object that they could use. And those are scaffolded assignments. And um, if you're following along in my slides, those links take you to the assignment uh, instructions. And they are scaffolded over the course of uh, six weeks, starting with week two. Um, 
and then it leads them through. So for the assignment transformation task, it walks them through the renewable assignment framework um, created by uh, Stacy Katz, um, which is also linked to in the Canvas uh, course as one of the readings that they did. And then for the instructor support participants, it takes them through creating a learning object, starting with learning outcomes and thinking about their audience. And then um, thinking about like what would be the best format to deliver an object to them. And then uh, so they get this step-by-step -step process of completing their learning circle project over the course of the six weeks of the learning circle. Um, and I'm going to let Jamie talk a little bit about the open pedagogy portal that is coming soon, 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 for real. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, yeah, so Amanda just demoed a little bit about the open pedagogy portal, but just to give some background information on it, um, it was really born out of uh, both this project with the learning circle and also the certificate in open educational practices that the OEN offers. And so we really wanted to create a space um, and a repository or a repertory where open pedagogy practitioners could find both discipline specific resources and general teaching and learning resources about open pedagogy. Um, and so in some of the examples Amanda showed you, for instance, with Lauren's renewable assignment, the goal is to have these case studies and write-ups of these renewable assignments, which we can then also link to student work, uh, work product and artifacts. So once Lauren is able to implement that history of science uh, renewable assignment in her course. We're hoping that some students will choose to openly license their work product and what, what has come out of that assignment. And then we'll be able to add that to the repository as well. Um, so then uh, folks who are coming to the repository will be able to get both uh, that case study, that write-up of the assignment, but also have real worked examples that they could share with their students. And then they can adapt those assignments to their own course, um, you know, change it in the ways that would best fit their assignment and their course that they're teaching. And then the second piece in the portal is the teaching and learning resources. And so these are infographics and professional development presentations and other training materials um, that we hope will be able to support you in, in your journey in open pedagogy and provide a place where you can learn more about the different principles of open pedagogy. Or if you need more resources to support training and teaching at your institution, this would be somewhere you could go to grab those types of materials. Um, so for instance, Amanda's really wonderful infographic on the renewable assignment spectrum is in the portal. We also had another um, PowerPoint presentation that was created as a professional development workshop that's been uploaded to the portal. And so these are all um, different teaching and learning resources you could take and adapt to your institutional context and be able to use those to support um, teaching and training at your own institution or your own um, edification around open pedagogy. And so right now we have uh, most of the learning circle projects uploaded uh, to the portal. And then the goal is to start collecting some of the projects from the certificate in open educational practices so that those can be added as well. Um, and then the, the end goal is to actually have a submission form on the portal so folks would be able to submit uh, teaching and learning resources or renewable assignments with student work product that we could then also feature um, in the portal. And one of the one of the main goals with having the portal designed the way it is, and uh, we didn't do um, as much sharing this part of it, but uh, if you go to the link, which I think Amanda put in the in the chat, um, you'll see that it's also um, organized by discipline. So we have it split up into these discipline specific areas, uh, which if you're if you've looked around at other open pedagogy sites, um, there's a lot of them out there that can provide really helpful information, but there hasn't been a way to really create that organizational structure around discipline specific content. And so that was one of the sort of layout uh, features that we really wanted to have with this portal and be able to really allow folks to go directly to where they need to find that content. Um, and then the other piece of this, and Amanda mentioned this in the very beginning, uh, but the portal is also sort of born out of this um, idea of shared abundance that the OEN is working towards within all of these strategic pathways. And so we really wanted to uh, be able to have uh, a place where we could really spread the wealth of these resources and create a place where folks can contribute to the broader work um, in open pedagogy. Um, and so if there's, once that, once that submission form is there. I hope you'll come back to the, the portal site and maybe think about any materials that you might be able to share that we could we could upload there.
And then the second piece I'm going to talk about right now are the consultations that we did during the learning circle. Uh, so the, the main goal for this was to really provide support and guidance on the different principles that we were talking about within each session on open pedagogy, as well as think about project finalization uh, for our participants. And so they were they were really meant to be just you know, sort of informal conversations um, for me to kind of act as a sounding board for our participants so they could talk through um, these different principles. I think one of the, the main topics of the discussions I had with folks was thinking about renewable versus disposable assignments and sort of thinking along that spectrum and how uh, based on different pieces that they might add to their assignment or the scaffolding that they might add to it, it becomes more renewable and less disposable. And then the, the second piece was really thinking about their projects. Um, so most of the, the folks I talked with had really great ideas and have been thinking about what they wanted to do to turn their assignment into a renewable assignment or to create their uh, learning object, uh, but maybe not as aware of what tools could really help them sort of see that vision come to life. Um, so my role was able, uh, I was able to sort of suggest tools that could help them build out what they were looking to do. Um, and also continue to think about student agency considerations. So making sure that when they're thinking of the different tools and what they're working on, that students were still going to have that choice in terms of licensing and how they could submit. Uh, so for instance, if they wanted to do something with FLIP and have students create videos as part of an assignment, make sure that there was also a way for students to submit a written assignment or to only submit audio versus doing video and audio. So that students still have that choice in terms of submission and then also making sure that somewhere in that assignment, licensing information is sort of scaffolded throughout so they can make that um, that decision in terms of their consent with their own IP and their work that they're submitting. And so throughout the, the seven weeks, I ended up meeting with uh, four participants, uh, three of our faculty members and one of our faculty uh, support members. And um, I think part of the the future of this connection with the participants will be offering different ways that we can connect. So they were really sort of set up as 30 minutes on Zoom, um, but not everybody necessarily had a chunk of time they could set aside to meet if it was just a very small, simple question they wanted to ask, or maybe just a, a quick tool tip that they, they might need. Um, and so we're thinking of sort of a way that we could iterate on this process and maybe add a Discord or Slack channel, um, and also remind folks that, you know, just emailing a question or setting up something asynchronous is absolutely available and certainly not a waste of time for me or for them, uh, no matter how small or big that kind of question or that talk that they wanna have is. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to talk about two of the, the projects um, of folks that I had met with. So one is the teacher toolbox and this was a teacher education program. Um, and uh, she was looking for a way to have students contribute to a body of work in their course. Um, and because of the way the teacher education program is set up, uh, it's something that students always email her after the semester ends saying, how can I see this thing that I created? Or how can I see this thing that my peers created? Because it continues to help them build their praxis within teacher education. Uh, but once they finish that course, you know, the LMS is locked out in terms of what they can access. Uh, so we decided that maybe a Google site might work that way students would be able to contribute there, but they would continue to have access long after the course has finished. Um, as And it would also become a resource for future courses too. And then uh, Amanda actually showed the other one, which is the OA at ETSU. That was Phil's um, learning object that he submitted. That was the open pedagogy site that Amanda shared. And so what is really nice about Phil's is he did include sort of all of those different topics that we had talked about with open pedagogy, inclusive teaching, accessibility. Um, but what he also did was add institutional context and resources. So within those pages, there are links um, and contact to uh, ETSU's Disability Services Center. And there's ways for folks to reach out and really um, contextualize what their, what Phil is sort of putting together for them and all of these open pedagogy resources. And because it's openly licensed, it's a really great thing that can be adapted. And then you can add your own institutional context to something like that. Okay. And I think that's back to you, Amanda. I get to talk about everybody's favorite topic now, assessment. Um, so the learning circle is designed with some assessment already built into it. So there are weekly check-ins through Mentimeter and the closing activities for really informal assessment about how things are going. Um, and then I recommend building in, and we did in the pilot one, a final check-in during the last session 
um, where you sort of do some overarching informal feedback about how the whole thing went. Um, so I asked, one of the fun questions I asked was like, what was your favorite session? And uh, it tied between caring for students in the open and then the open, and pedag open pedagogy, social justice and DEI week or a combination of multiple sessions, which I thought was really exciting. And then we also put together a more formal evaluation at the end of the uh, experience through a survey. And you know, we all know how surveys go, but we're really happy to get about half of the participants who regularly attended to respond. So six out of about 12. And I'm going to tell you about all the things that they said. So we were curious about how they uh, would view the use of Mentimeter uh, throughout the uh, uh, learning circle. And uh, of the six people, they all really enjoyed it. They it helped them feel more engaged in the experience. Um, and that was great feedback to get. Um, I also wanted to know how they felt about the final uh, project. And 83% said that it was a good way for them to apply what they had learned during the circle. And then one person is how this shakes out. Um, felt that it was busy work. Hmm. And then um, the other question we asked is asked was if they felt that completing the learning circle would help them improve their teaching or uh, help them more confidently assist instructors in improving their teaching through the power of open pedagogy. And we had 66.7% say strongly agree and 33.3% .3 say that they agreed. So no disagreement that they didn't find value in this or that it didn't help them improve or gain confidence in the topic. Okay, so we are going to experience the learning circle. Um, it's not going to be quite as holistic as the learning circle sessions, but I think only Amanda is here who would know that. Um, but I'm still going to, because I have broken it down into the different activities and, um, but we're gonna go through this together. And um, the goal is for you to experience the learning circle as a participant would have. Um, get a feel for the way that the polling worked in the learning circle. And also we'll do a little bit of community building through some of the questions that we uh, that I have to ask you. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with opening activities. And each week we start by getting everybody into Mentimeter. Um, and so Jamie, would you drop the Menteach link in the chat again? Um, and then if not, you can join at menti.com and enter the code 4387-7490. And I love to see those little hearts fly. So if you want to click them to let me know that you're in there, that'd be great. And I'll give you a little bit of time to get into the Menti meter. All right, keep joining if you haven't joined yet. I'm gonna go ahead and take us through to our first question. How are you feeling today? Are you feeling sleepy, energized, mellow, frazzled, fabulous? I didn't put one on there for me. Um, so I'm gonna go with sleepy personally. I'm feeling a little sleepy. Lots of mellow folks. Look at that little marshmallow dance. Hmm. You might need to click through the slides if it kept you in. Yeah, it's a lot of slides. I'm a, I, I, I will tell you that it's a lot of slides. Awesome. Okay, so we have some sleepy folks. We have some energized folks. No one's feeling fabulous today, but you know what? That's okay. Oh, thank you, Jason. The mellow folks have been out, outdone by the frazzled and the sleepy folks. All right, we're gonna move to our next question. So we would do that kind of check-in every time. And then we'd ask a fun question to sort of build community. So what is your favorite ice cream flavor? And um, Amanda will know that I have not edited this the last time we did it because we had discussed that there should be an option for multiple 
but we'll say if you like multiple ones, you may put it in the chat under other. But you have the option of vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, cookie dough, uh, mint chocolate chip, salted caramel. Uh, I do not like ice cream. If you do not like ice cream, what do you eat when it is hot out and you need a refreshing, a refreshment? Ooh, butter pecan. Ooh, lavender honey. Banana. Oh, these all sound delicious. Now I want ice cream really badly. That's the other problem with making food pulls is that you get hungry for the food that folks put in. Did I catch everybody? Pistachio. Ooh, something seasonal. I do like seasonal flavors. All the ice cream all the time. That's my category. That's my category too. All the ice cream all the time. I am known for planning ice cream adventures when I travel to conferences and things. Okay, so let's see how this shook out. We have six people who are interested in chocolate ice cream, four people who like cookie dough. Now, growing up, cookie dough is like my go to flavor as a kiddo. Uh, mint chocolate chip has six. Tied with chocolate and salted caramel. Other put it in the chat. We had lots of great options in the chat. And we have one person who does not enjoy ice cream. And you know what? That's okay. That means there's more ice cream for the rest of us. All right. And then we would segue into doing a little bit of presentation and some discussion activity. So the first one we're going to do, the first question we're going to ask is, how familiar are you with open pedagogy? There's no right or wrong answers. Um, and we're just trying to get an idea of where we're at. We have five folks so far who say they can define it. Four who know what it, oh, six who know what it is. I should let those numbers stack up before I start talking about them. One has, one person has heard of it. No blinky kitties though, so far. I think it's gonna be a pretty strong tie between I know what it is and I can define it. There are too many definitions and we're gonna go through them in just a second. Okay, 15 and 15, it's tied now. I think that's a good way. We'll move on from there with it tied. So the first thing I'm gonna make you do though is posit an answer as to how would you personally define open pedagogy? Again, no wrong answers. This is about how you see open pedagogy. Uh, so far, we have involving students in the creation of OER with their permission and agency, student-centered learning and knowledge creation, a teaching practice that includes things like reusable assignments, student co-created content, and openly sharing teaching processes, practices, inviting students into the content creation process, an instructional approach empowering students to transition from consumers of knowledge to producers of knowledge, Collaborations between students and faculty in order to include student voices and learning. Students as content and knowledge creators. A method of teaching that encourages act, students to act as co-creators in learning. So through renewable assignments, learners can share their knowledge and experience and help their community members learn. Oh, I love the focus on community in that one. Open pedagogy is an approach to instruction that incorporates student-created work with an open access format. For example, students contribute to materials that will feature that future courses will use. Assignments that have students create things that are useful to themselves or future students. Student-led learning experiences that offer agency and multiple means of expression. Teaching in a way that has students creating works rather than, because I see some definite themes here. Teaching in a way that has students creating works rather than consuming material and including and sharing work with more than just the professor. Using open licensing to engage students as creators. A type of problem-based or project-based learning that puts students at the heart of the classroom with a focus on openness and sharing with a broader community. Teaching that centers students as the drivers of education and leverages open resources for the use and creation. Student engagement with the par participation and creation of OER. Students co-creating learning objects and content. Pedagogy that is inclusive of students as co-creator of knowledge, including students into the curriculum through renewable assignments, assignments in which students create content that can be shared publicly, an innovative teaching practice that involves students as creators of learning materials, an approach that includes collaborating with students in their own teaching and learning, often but not, not always, leading to the creation of one or more OER, 
assignments in which students create content that can be created publicly. I think I said that one already. Engaging students as students, giving agency to their learning. These are all really excellent definitions. And I think that you will see that those are reflected in the definitions that I have pooled for this conversation. They are great definitions and open up pedagogy is definitely awesome. So we have to start at the beginning with Wiley. In 2013, Wiley defines open pedagogy as a set of teaching and learning practices that are only possible in the context of free access and for our permissions, characteristic of open educational resources. He, of course, had to redefine this in 2017 when he added the fifth R. So then it becomes the same thing, but then they engage in the five R activities. And so what are the five R activities of OER? They are reuse, so you get to reuse the resource in a variety of ways as it currently exists. You can remix it, combine two or more OERs to create content mashups. Redistribute, so you get to share it in its original format, a revised format, or a remixed format. It can be revised, so it can be adapted, modified, improved to fit the needs of the local context. And it allows us to retain, so we get to make, own, and control our own copies of the content. Then we have Catherine Conan, who talks about this in the sense of open educational practices, who defines it as the use, reuse, creation of OER and collaborative pedagogical practices for employing social and participatory technologies for interaction, peer learning, knowledge creation, and sharing, and the empowerment of learners. Robin DeRosa and Rajiv Jangiani in their What is Open Pedagogy on the Open Pedagogy Notebook, describe this as a site of practice, a place where theories about learning, teaching technology, and social justice enter into conversation with each other and inform the development of educational practices and structures. They go on to say that it's an access-oriented commitment to learner-driven education and as a process of designing architectures and using tools for learning that enables students to shape the public knowledge commons of which they are a part. And they say, we might insist on the centrality of the five R's to those to the work of open pedagogy. Lauren Ray has rounded up some bullet points here that she shares with instructors that they leverage the open nature of OER to facilitate learning. They put an emphasis on community and collaboration, sharing resources, ideas, and power. Uh, we get that idea of renewable versus disposable assignments, that connection to the wider public. And examples that students can create, annotate, curate, update, adapt, assess, or and then op assess openly licensed work. They can also create openly licensed work. Um, and then I really like um, this particular take that sort of bridges the idea of open with information literacy because I'm a librarian and that's what we do. Um, but Paul Bond writes that the real benefit of open resources comes not from free textbooks, but from the freedom of students to be involved in the development, curation, and maintenance of open resources, and that those active activities to do that exercise information literacy skills. And I think that it's also really important to consider Jing Yanni's five R's for open pedagogy when we're thinking about defining it. Uh, particularly when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and who's participating in creating open pedagogy activities and assignments. So those five R's are respect, reciprocate, risk, which is the one I like to focus on, reach, and also resistance, which is another one that I like to focus on in my definitions of thinking about open pedagogy. So I promised I would show you my uh, roadmap for scaffolded experiences. I would also argue that uh, in addition to open pedagogy projects requiring consent, they also require intense scaffolding so that students are getting the best possible experience in the classroom while doing this. And that might look like this for a long-term open pedagogy project across a semester. So first thing we wanna make sure that there's expectation setting. What are they doing and why are they doing it? Why does this matter? Um, and, uh, and then what does working in the open mean? So that might be a Creative Commons licensing training. That might be having a broader conversation about open access publishing, um, thinking about open broadly and having those conversations with students. And then doing a tool training for whatever tool we've selected, if we've selected a tool, to do these open pedagogy assignments. And then we let students go and do the work. 
But we also then want to make sure that we're checking in with them. How's the work going? Where do they need support? Are they having issues with the tool? Are they having difficulty? Um, and are they struggling with this idea of authoring in the open and suddenly having authority as a content creator? And what does that mean when it's tied to a grade? And then our final projects would get turned in. And if your institution would require it, there would be a student authoring agreement signed. And that can look like a lot of different things. Uh, it could be a memorandum of understanding with students. It could be a FERPA waiver, depending on the project and the context. And then we also want to think about checking the licenses. Got to do our due diligence and make sure that we have picked compatible licenses for the end product. That includes images students might have selected for what they're doing. Um, I often find that if there's a problem with the license, it is attached to an image typically. And then we're going to publish the final version of that. You are welcome to this graphic. 100% is openly licensed. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Um, OK, so with all of that in mind, all of the things that we have talked about, what sort of things, what relevant themes stand out to you from not only these definitions of open pedagogy, but also the definitions of open pedagogy that you have shared with each other? And I'm going to give you some time to generate some answers here. This already looks very familiar to the one that we did in the pilot learning circle uh, with what words are larger than other words. Community and collaboration are fighting it out right now. Agency, I love that. Student empowerment, renewable participation, scaffolding. Scaffolding is so important and it's often overlooked. Um, because we just assume that instructors know to do it and that they don't necessarily understand maybe all the underpinnings of what needs to be scaffolded when we're talking about working in the open. Consent, yes, absolutely. Students as creators, student rights, experiential design, student-centered, authentic learning, openness, empowerment, challenge. Oh, I love challenge. Social justice. Um, Creativity, iteration. I also really like iteration and thinking about when we build open pedagogy projects, how can our students iterate on what has come before? Uh, voice, choice, challenge, sharing. These are all really excellent themes that you have pulled out. Good job, everybody. So pretend you are an instructor because that's who this is designed for, this particular question. We would ask them, are you already doing some of these things in your courses? And so um, a lot of times we get a lot of I think so's because they didn't realize they were kind of already doing it with some of this stuff, um, or at least they had already started down that pathway. Uh, so lots of, lots of I think so's is not surprising to me. And those not yet's are opportunities. Okay, so then I would follow up with a question that if they are using open pedagogy in their course room, what are they doing? And if not, what would you like to incorporate? Incorporate. So if you are in that not yet category, what is appealing to you to have students do in the classroom as an open pedagogy experience? So we have renewable assignments, student empowerment, students creating videos, building on student created content in subsequent semesters, absolutely. Uh, more student choice. Yes, I love the idea of more student choice. So not only in, uh, there's so many avenues with open pedagogy. So it could be, they could have choice in topics. They could have choice in the format of what they create. Um, are they making videos? Are they gonna make a podcast? Are they creating a document? Are they working on an openly licensed textbook? Um, are they doing open annotation? That's a great one. Um, and I love annotation, I like to think of as sort of like the gateway assignment to open pedagogy. 
Um, it's easy to implement most of the time and has a lot of value. Uh, the only thing that's tricky is if you're using hypothesis and you go the group method and that can get a little tricky. Uh, students co-created an OER, small groups collaborated to write a chapter. Students were encouraged to rewrite math word problems using their own examples to make them more relevant to them. You know, that is really lovely. Um, that probably would have made math more exciting to me if they were, if math examples were more relevant. Providing options, lots of student choice, students create classroom guidelines. That's also a great point. Like you can also start off the semester with your students um, collaboratively creating the classroom guidelines for how they want to talk to each other, what the code of conduct is, uh, more options for students select from format, type of engagement with the assignment, more time for open pedagogy project, less on traditional coursework, Flipgrid, uh, care for students' emotions and experiences, absolutely. Uh, building in better expectations for end of semester open pedagogy work at the start. Students openly license photographs to increase DEI. I love that option. That sounds like a great assignment. Sharing of students' own experiences, absolutely. We have a real opportunity to center students in the coursework and their lived experiences are often going to be shared lived experience among other students. Okay, let's move forward. So what are you what excited you about the topics that we covered today? Blueprint for faculty. Overall guidance, care, resources provided, a way forward, open pedagogy, community, the resources we shared, ideas, examples, accessibility work, overall guidance, community again, resources to adopt. I really like that care is one of the big ones because I think that's also something that underpins this conversation is not only do we need to care for our students in the classroom, we need to care for our instructors who are doing this open pedagogy work if we're not the instructor. And then um, also we need to extend that care to ourselves thinking about our own capacity to do this kind of work and to support this kind of work. Lovely, a concrete place to start. Possibility, shareable with faculty. Ready-made resources. All right, let's move forward. So then the session will move into some closing activities and the opening activities and closing activities, I made the same throughout each session. So um, we talked about what's one thing that you're taking away from today's session. Yay, the Google Drive folder, absolutely. Um, so we would ask them what was one thing that they were taking away from today's session, and then I would use that information in my um, email that I would send them after the um, session. Lots of resources, so many links and open tabs, how to structure a learning circle experience, collaboration ideas, a curriculum that I can adopt locally, absolutely, and I want you to really, really, like, this is very plug and play customizable, take what you can do, inspiration to finally learn how to use Mentimeter properly. I am happy to talk you through that. Software tools to learn, ideas for a learning circle at my institution, your email, which I will follow up with later. Resources for sure. Lovely. Okay, so then we would ask them how they were feeling after doing. So this is the second temperature check they would do. So after experiencing it, the content for that day, how are they feeling? So how are you feeling after having the opportunity to um, come together and define open pedagogy together and share resources with each other? Uh, we've got lots of folks who are excited. We have some folks who are ready to go. Let's do this. I think we're gonna stick in those two, two folders. In our learning circle, we had somebody who answered that they were overwhelmed every week. 
And we checked in every time and reminded them that this was a community project and that if they needed help, that we were here for them. And so like, that's a great way to sort of like facilitate that overwhelm because it's very easy for us to get overwhelmed in academia and all the things we have going on and all the meetings and all the emails. I mean, my email overwhelms me every day. Um, so that's just an idea if you're thinking about that. So let's talk about the curriculum, which we have come here today to discuss. So um, it's dangerous out there to go alone. Please take this curriculum and use it and adopt it and make it work for your local, in, you know, local context. So this is a curriculum for facilitating a learning circle on open pedagogy. It's designed to be modular, customizable, and, and a customizable experience for um, facilitators. This is Ronan. He says hello. He's going to go away now. Um, you have to pick and choose what pieces work for your institutional context, or you can run the whole learning circle as is. The choice is you. And while the topics here covered are specifically related to open pedagogy, I do want you to realize that it's possible to drop any topic into the basic structure of the learning circle for facilitation. So for example, the most concrete example I came up when I was thinking about the slide was that it would be really easy to take the same components that we just did, opening activities, discussion, closing activities, those temperature checks, and center it around the topic of OER definitions instead of open pedagogy. So you could do this sort of like, sort of like people who aren't at open pedagogy yet. Um, or you could scaffold it where you start with OER definitions and then maybe session three, you're ready to talk about open pedagogy. So please feel free to customize this to fit your local context and what the uh, audience at your institution are ready to talk about. So what do you get in the, um, it, what do you get in the curriculum? So the first thing that you get is the OEN Learning Circle on Open Pedagogy Canvas course that contains the how to use the curriculum information. It's the same as the how to use the curriculum document in the Google folder. Um, there are seven session modules there that contain all of the pre-work. Um, each week has the renewable assignment digital learning object broken out for that week. There's the tool of the week broken out, a uh, page for further resources, and then what's next to help facilitate them into the next week session. And then there is a facilitator resources module that links out to the Google curriculum folder. You also get the Google curriculum folder. So um, that will have the how to use this curriculum documentation, um, which walks you through some of what we'll talk about today, but in a little bit more detail. Um, it has an activities folder. Um, I'm still updating that. So that one is not quite complete, but there are a start of activities there. Um, I'm gonna go through all of my Mentimeter sessions and pull those activities and put them in that folder. Um, email templates, form templates, um, the call for participation template is in there. Um, there are facilitator handouts that walk you through what you do as your part of the session. There are participate handouts that walk them through what's their part of the session, including their pre-work. Um, all of my slide decks from the Learning Circle are there and available for you to adopt and adapt and use as is if you'd like. Um, then there's the Learning Circle project folder, which has both of the assignments broken out into individual documents. And then Jamie created a really wonderful open pedagogy Learning Circle tools documentation um, document that uh, we made the cutest uh, like difficulty level graphic to tell you how hard the tools were for that. And I'm gonna let Jamie talk about it now. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, so this is a, it's kind of like you get a car and you get a car and you get a car. Um, and so now we're at the the learning tools documentation. And so um, Amanda and I really worked together to think about the different pedagogical purposes and use cases, you know, that folks would be thinking about in the learning circle and how they might be incorporating these learning tools. Um, and Amanda, Amanda mentioned earlier that um, really the goal was to think about centering learning first and then incorporating a tool uh, as opposed to thinking of a, oh, a shiny new tool I want to try how can I jam this into what I'm trying to work with? Um, and so the the goal was to have it uh, to align to those different use cases with specific specific learning tools and really keep them all in one place for the participants to go back to. And so it's not um, all encompassing of every single learning tool that's out there, but it is relatively robust with um, at least four different tools uh, per section or use case. 
Um, and it is important to note, this was one of the things that we've talked about in the sessions as well, is that uh, we wanted to include as many open tools as we could for those different use cases, uh, so that based on institutional context, folks would have a choice that would be uh, more suitable or appropriate for them and their institution. And so we, we did a basic overview of all the tools during the tool showcase. That was session number six that Amanda talked about. Um, so we were able to discuss a little bit more in detail about each of these tools and some provide some examples of the ways that these tools could be used um, for each of those pedagogical practices. Um, so for, for example, there's a section, a use case for community building. It's one of the tools that's on there is Padlet. And so we talked about ways that you could use Padlet to really accomplish um, a sense of community building with your students. Um, so students can contribute anonymously to discussion questions using Padlet and the sticky note option. Um, there could also be different sticky notes with different topics or different Padlet boards with different topics where students could build out additional resources that go along with those different topics. And it can be something that students can continue to contribute and sort of live beyond uh, the LMS and, and that course. And so the, the guide is set up so that it is organized by that use case first, but there's also an index with all the tools alphabetically listed. And then each tool has links to instructional materials on how to use it, um, licensing information if, um, if that's applicable to that cert certain tool, and then also the difficulty of use rating that Amanda mentioned. And so um, if you take a look at it, you'll see there's a range of one to five and they're all little little bubbles of computers. And so based on the rating, one or two or three bubbles are filled in with uh, the OEN colors. And so one is the easiest, five is the most difficult in terms of use. And I think the highest we have on there is a level three. Um, but it's also, in thinking about, you know, learning tools, it is a bit dependent on, you know, sort of baseline technological skills in general and, you know, familiarity with learning tools. So that sort of um, rating system, you know, might sort of vary and bend forward or backward a little bit. Um, but I think in terms of a general general use case, um, that is a, a pretty pretty realistic difficulty setting, I think. Um, and so that is all linked in the in the curriculum and available to use as well. Thank you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to talk about like actually facilitating. Um, so getting started, um, I recommend that you read through the how to use this curriculum document and all of the facilitator handouts and then browse the Canvas curriculum just to really become really familiar with everything so that you can make decisions. Um, and then decide who your audience is. For most folks, you'll still likely be instructors. I'm a weirdo. Um, I do a lot of professional development for other uh, like support staff, and that's probably the use case that I'll be using it in. But um, it's, you can build, you can like, you can take away the parts that are for instructor support folks, or you can take away the instructor part if you, that's not your, who you're talking to. Um, so decide who your audience is, and then you're going to put together your call for participants. And you might want to think about, is this a targeted call to a, a specific department or college, or is it a general call? We did a general call, just like, hey, who wants to come hang out with us and learn about open pedagogy? And um, folks in the OEN network did a really great job of like sharing it with faculty and we had a bunch of apply and it was really excellent. Um, and then how many sessions will you have? How long will you meet? Um, the sessions are set up as one hour sessions right now, but that might not work with your time frame. Um, and then figure out your selection criteria. Um, we used pretty much the broad general OEN uh, selection criteria where we wanted to make sure that we had representation from multiple kinds of institutions. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were paying attention to diversity as well. And um, and then decide how long your learning circle will be. Again, ideally between 12 to 15 people, but you need to remember to account for attrition over sessions. We started with 18. We ended up with about 11 or 12 who showed up regularly. Um, decide whether you'll meet virtually in person or hybrid and when the sessions will be held. Decide whether you'll have participants complete a learning circle project or if you'll be offering a certificate of completion. Uh, we hadn't planned on a certificate of completion, but folks really wanted it. And so we ended up creating one um, for them. And then you're going to release your call into the wild and let folks come to you. Um, and then I recommend sending emails every week, uh, starting with an opening email that welcomes folks to the learning circle and provides them with all the resources they need to get started for week one. And then each week I send out an email that included takeaways from the previous week. Again, that wasn't applicable for week one. What the session was about, any session materials. And then I attached the Menti results. Uh, if you're using different polling software and that's an option. Um, 
you could do that. And then any resources that you promise participants. So I sent them my open licensing quiz one week. And then when the learning circle is over, I have two templates for wrap up emails. One is a closing email for when the learning circle is over that expresses your gratitude, again, thinking about shared abundance uh, for their participation. And then a second email with the wrap up of their projects. Um, and then pulling in tools. So we use Mentimeter. I love Mentimeter. Um, I actually started on the other side where I was like, ah, Mentimeter is crap. Nobody ever uses it right. And then somehow I turned into this person who uses Mentimeter for everything. And, um, and I find it so valuable that I pay for it out of my own pocket. But I recommend identifying what tools are available at your institution first. So um, are you a Zoom school? Are you a Google school? Uh, are you a Microsoft school? Like what tools do you have available to you that are essentially supported and starting there? Um, and then I say, pick your favorite poll, way to poll participants. This could be through Mentimeter. It could be Zoom polls that you set up. It could be poll everywhere, which is my least favorite. You could do a Kahoot. Um, I recommend using polling throughout the sessions, even if you do in-person sessions to do those open closing and discussion activities just to get things started. So what's in a session? The sessions are decided are designed to run an hour. They start out with that temperature check. How are folks feeling? Then we do an opening activity, a fun question that helps them to get to know each other better, which was like super hit with our learning circle pilot. Then you do a presentation of the concepts, discussion activity on those concepts. Um, temperature check again to see how folks are feeling after the session, and then closing activity to see what they're taking away. Um, and then there's a wrap-up slide with details for the next week, assignment reminders, and their pre-work information. And then running sessions. So a virtual way of doing this was to create a recurring invite with your favorite meeting software. So whether you use Zoom, Teams, Google Hangouts, whatever works in your institutional context, uh, invite your participants, uh, refer to the facilitation handouts for each session, um, build out your opening, closing, and discussion activities. You'll be able to just pick what you want to do for that week. Um, make sure to establish early on how folks can participate. Um, will they be participating with their cameras on or off? Um, chat only, chat and voice, what do they feel comfortable with? Let's go back to slide. There we go. Uh, will you call on people? Will you ask people to share more context about poll answers if they're comfortable? Um, we had that happen. It was really uh, robust. Um, and folks were always happy to expand on what they had said. Uh, and then ask participants before deciding to record sessions. Because again, we're trying to build a space where they feel comfortable to do uncomfortable things and learn and grow together. Running sessions in person, I have given some thought to this and how that might look. So you'll want to identify where you'll meet and book that room for all the sessions, if that's something you can do. You want to ask what technology you have access to and the location you're holding sessions in. Uh, do, do folks need to bring their own technology in order to participate in that location? Uh, are you providing food? Like this often could be a lunch and learn kind of activity. So are you providing lunch, light snacks, beverages? Are they bringing their own beverages? We encourage people to eat during ours. I always encourage stickity snacks. Um, and then again, you'll use those opening, closing, and discussion activities. Ask participants how comfortable they feel communicating throughout the uh, sessions. Do they want to be called on? Do they want to raise their hands? Do they just want to have a free-for-all conversation? Um, building out community norms at the very beginning of that is probably going to be really important. And then prepare examples ahead of time for each session topic so that you can break the silence and get that conversation flowing. It's a little easier in a virtual environment where you have the Mentimeter or the polling software to help you have those discussions. Okay, assessment. Plan your assessment prior to the call for participants. So thinking about, will you do a survey? Are you gonna use those closing activities to collect informal data? What kind of data do you wanna collect? Since it was a pilot, I really wanted to know if they felt the sessions were useful, how I could improve them. And if they come, and we wanted to know if they found the consultations uh, worthwhile. They did, <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, and then the learning circle project, you get to decide if you're gonna have them do this or not. So I really like the idea of marrying the act of doing open pedagogy to the act of learning about open pedagogy because it helps transfer skills and it gives them something that they can walk away with and use after the learning circle project, but that doesn't mean that that fits your institutional context. So, um, but the learning circle project documentation is there to help you scaffold their projects and uh, you'll just want to make sure that you provide time for them to ask questions about the project either synchronously 
or um, I'm sorry, asynchronously through email or chat software or provide some time for individual consultations. Mm -hmm. So our lessons learned from this project include housekeeping right away. So I didn't think about this in the first week and we included this slide in the second week. So we had some questions that came in and the first ones we wanted to set some norms. So we let them know that they were feel free to have their cameras on or off, feel free to unmute or use the chat. We had lots of chat participation. And then we had like a handful of people who would unmute throughout the sessions. Um, and then um, since they wanted a certificate of completion, we figured out how we would work that out for them. And then we had somebody who wanted to know about the makeup of the instructor of the participants. At that point, we had already lost somebody. Um, they had to drop out because of their dissertation work. I'm like, yes, please go get your PhD. That's way more important. Um, but we ended up with 11 participants, uh, instructor participants, and six support, instructor support participants. Um, and then with consultations, like Jamie said earlier, we needed to be more clear that like they weren't limited to these 30 minute Zoom calls. Like they should feel free to email us or chat with us or um, shoot us a question or have a shorter amount of time in a Zoom call. Like we needed to be a little more clear about that and that we could have answered those questions. So in the future, Jamie will iterate on that so that they have more options. And then just some general learning circle takeaways um, that came through the evaluation was that uh, folks wanted a link to the Canvas course in the weekly emails. We had someone who was just using the weekly emails and never touched the Canvas curriculum because it wasn't in the weekly emails. So we have updated that so that there is a Canvas link in all of those. Uh, provide more direction on the final project and give examples. Now that we have gone through the pilot project, we will have some examples to give. Um, and then build in more formative assessments of the casual Canvas course, which uh, that one surprised me. I wasn't anticipating that people would want to do more activities in the Canvas course, um, but we'll be iterating on that in the future. And then uh, we updated the project submission form to include link intakes because that was just complete oversight on my part that we missed it. And then the other thing that I did after going through and assessing everybody's projects, just to make sure that they had completed it, I went and I looked at them. Uh, figured out if they were openly licensed, um, it would be helpful to also include a field for them to describe what their project was in their own words. And now I'm going to turn it over to y'all for questions for the last 11 minutes. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing your screen after I show you my puppy Winnie. So this is my little puppy Winston. He's an adorable corgi. Um, and he thanks you for coming and paying attention to me today. But now we'll open the floor to questions. Feel free to ask them in the chat or to unmute. So, Amanda, you may have mentioned this, but did you run the sessions weekly, monthly? Like, what was about the frequency? And the, well, I guess that second part of that, how long was the time frame of the learning circle? Yeah, that's a great question. So we ran them weekly. They started... Um, in early March during open ed week was our kickoff meeting and they ran on for seven weeks until mid April. So we had seven sessions and they were each an hour long and Melissa it's completely okay to process I'm a processor. You can email me questions later if you want, I will answer them I promise. Yeah, but we did consecutive weeks so seven consecutive weeks. And um, that last session was show and tell so that they could show off their projects. Do you think seven weeks was the right amount of time? So there were some weeks where the content was pretty packed in to them. And if you do not talk fast like me, you might want to break those conversations into um, more segments. Um, we did talk about whether it would be worthwhile to have sort of um, uh, eighth week we have kicked around that idea. We have talked about that. Um, and we had a um, we had feedback that they would also that somebody had the idea that there could be a week where they choose the topic, and that is interesting, but we haven't talked about yet what that would look like. I'm not sure how you would facilitate that without being in the same institutional context as the people that you were in the learning circle with. Um, that makes it a lot easier than many disparate institutional contexts, which is what we had. 
So it's it's the ever present. It depends, Beth. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I started type it and then it got complicated. Um. So one thing that jumped out at me, I super loved um the way you talk about onboarding people for the for interactivity and use of tools, which is great. Um. I haven't found the secret sauce for the faculty I work with. And, and inevitably, no matter how hard I try redundancy examples and whatever, I don't always bring everybody on board. And so I'm curious, like what has been your experience with, because obviously this requires a lot of use of tech tools. Um, what, what do you do with that kind of experience? Like how do you address those sorts of challenges? Yeah, I would say that we had, we definitely had a variety of like technical abilities with tools in the learning circle. There were people who were way more uh, fluent in digital technology and then than the other folks. Um, and I think that, so let's use Mentimeter as an example. Um, using Mentimeter to get them into the conversation and um, and in that instance, just providing a little extra space for them to have time to get into there and sort of like building that into the timeline of your facilitating those questions. One thing that I changed about the way I had Mentimeter set up across sort of the, um, the sessions was it started off where I had them stuck at my presenter pace. They couldn't answer a, a question until the next one. I found that setting that to audience pace made it a lot easier for people to answer questions and in a more timely manner and have them there and ready to go for facilitating that conversation. Um, particularly for the people who like struggle to get into the Mentimeter and then they're just like, okay, I'm here now, what do I do? I wanna click all the things. Um, and then, um, I found that in the tool conversations, I mentioned this briefly on one of the slides, our tool conversations were like the row, some of the most robust conversations that we had. And it was really great to kind of let them co-facilitate that conversation. And that was one of the things that was really nice about having instructional support folks there was that they could talk about like how they help their faculty and resources that they use with their faculty to do that. And um, and also different ways that they could set up that tool. And then you have the instructor perspective of, I do X, Y, Z with this tool, and this is how I set it up. And so that was a really nice balance to sort of like, like let them help mitigate that technology issue with each other. Okay, I see a question in the chat. Curious about the application process for your participation participants. Did you consider readiness for this learning focus? For example, would you recommend this type of learning experience for someone on the newer side of OER exploration and use? Um, so we did leave it pretty general for folks um, to participate. And um, I don't remember if we had a question that asked them if they were familiar in our call for proposals, but that is in the uh, Google Drive. Um, in the forms, there is the call for proposal in there, and you can see the questions that we asked them. Um, I, I do think that we had some folks who were less ready to have this conversation than others, but I think by starting it in a spot where you are starting at the very beginning with a definition building and collaborative definition building, and you can get everybody on the same page, you can sort of scaffold it from there. Um, if they haven't heard of OER before, it might be a rougher conversation, and maybe you need to start your learning circle off like back a couple sessions, like build in a couple more sessions around OER and like here's definitions for OER and then here's how to find OER and then let's talk about teaching with OER and maybe phrase it that way as part of that sort of scaffolded project might be useful in that context. I'm gonna put my email in the chat. If you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can also feel free to reach out to Jamie or Tanya um, and we'll figure out who's the best person to answer the question. Um, yeah, and there's my email address in the chat. Um, it's also in the slides. Are you going to ask me a question, Catherine? I'd love to ask you a question. I'm curious about um, the the learning circle. So, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with communities of practice and inquiry groups and learning groups and various kinds of things that overlap a little bit. I was just wondering, 
especially when you're talking about the reading that you all did at the beginning, um, if there's something about the learning circle that made you decide to use that terminology in this particular structure or just anything else about that that you'd be willing to share. I feel like that's a question for Tanya and Dave Ernst to hire me to come make a learning circle. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, but I will say um, I'm very familiar with sort of the literature around communities of practice. And like the person who's most cited in that conversation is still Wenger. And they cite work of theirs from 1998. Uh, what I will tell you about what we found is that there's not a whole lot of journal articles around this topic. There's a lot of books and like, and like, I'm talking about like, we, we just were like learning circle, like, let's figure out what that is. And so like, we were in like some Nordic education system, like learning about learning circles. Um, and then also this is uh, common in uh, business mentoring, like it's, it's a businessy kind of thing. There was a lot of research in that area. Um, and then we also looked at Karen Pakula's uh, learning circles in Minnesota and um, the Open Pedagogy Incubator at NC State with Will Cross. And um, there's lots of good, um, lots of um, good um, conversations around that conversation sort of happening in this space. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you both for sharing all this excellent work. Any last questions before we say goodbye or so long? See you soon. I am so glad at the response that y'all have had to this. That just makes my heart so happy. As a participant would highly recommend. Oh yes, I didn't tell you the other thing. The other uh, recommendation that we got was from one of our participants. They left us a really nice testimonial that said, I knew a lot about OERs, but I didn't understand how that differed from open pedagogy. And now that I understand I can use open pedagogy deliberately and I hope effectively to make assignments that are more motivating to my students and have an impact on the community. And that was from Dr. Tamara Powell, who is an English professor who joined us. Thank you all for coming.